Welcome to part four of our racism, social justice, and the woke movement equipping hour series. Uh, this week, what we'll be doing is uh, discussing some myths and misinformation is what I'm titling this, Myths and Misinformation. And I want to answer four or five questions that seem to be a significant part of what, what we're hearing in our day about justice from proponents of uh, woke thinking. And so I'm, I'm going to pray, and, and then we'll jump in. God, thank you so much for your word. Your word is light. It gives light. Just as you are good and do good, I pray that you would shepherd us now from your word. Help us to think well using your perfect word, the standard that you have set for justice, what you have called just and right and good and true. And God, we know that so long as we cling to your word, so long as we say what you have said, so long as we think in keeping with your truth, that we can't go wrong. And where we do fall short, it is because we have fallen short in staying close to what you've spoken. Guide us now and give us attentive ears so that we would be more convinced over the next hour of the wisdom of your commands, of the goodness of your instructions, of the authority of your person and your scriptures. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, so we've uh, been through the clarity and sufficiency of Scripture to address these issues. We've defined justice. We've worked to draw out principles for applying God's justice on these issues. And this morning, five questions having to do with myths and misinformation commonly associated with the woke movement. Question number one on your outline, are black people capable of racism? Are black people capable of racism? James Cone, the father of black liberation theology, which is a, a belief that the liberation of the oppressed, namely black people, is what the God of the scriptures is all about. James Cone has grained, uh, gained an incredible amount of popularity among professing evangelicals in our day. Uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about him, you can visit the Elder blog. There's a, an, an article that I posted there titled ja the, the Gospel According to James Cone. It's is just a list of extensive quotes if you're curious what he believes specifically about the gospel that we profess. And then you'll be baffled why so many Christians are, are running after him. But here's how he would answer this question, are black people capable of racism? He says, the feeling of black hatred for whites should not be identified as black racism. Black racism is a myth created by whites to ease their guilt feelings. While it is true that blacks do hate whites, black hatred is not racism. That's in his book, Black Theology and Black Power. Uh, again, he, he says in the same book, where are the examples among blacks in which they sought to assert their right to dominance over others because of a belief in black superiority? Modern racism is, a Europe, is European in origin 
and America has been its vigorous offspring. It is the white man who has sought to dehumanize others because of his feelings of superiority or for his economic advantage. Racism is so embedded in this country that it is hard to imagine that any white man can escape it. And there you see the perpetuation of the same ideas we're hearing by more modern writers. So James Cone is included in his definition of racism, the idea that one ethnic people group's right to assert power or dominance over another ethnic group is what racism is. It's when a group asserts their right of power or dominance over another group. And since there are so few examples of blacks who believed that they had a right to dominate whites, then he concluded that blacks can't be racist and even justified black Muslims who did believe they had a right to dominate white people because he had to have an explanation for that. Uh, if you remember last week, Robin D'Angelo, author of White Fragility, because she misdefines racism as a, race, a racial group's collective prejudice being backed by the power of legal authority and institutional control, because that in her, is her definition of racism, that it's this far-reaching system that functions independently from the intentions of self, or self-images of individual actors, then she would also come to the conclusion that while blacks can be discriminatory and perhaps prejudiced, because they lack the institutional power and authority to leverage that over other people groups, then they therefore cannot be racist by definition. This is a, a good reminder for us that a foundational principle of justice is just having right definitions. Right definitions meaning God's definitions of things. If we wrongly define what a sin is, then we will wrongly define its solution. If your doctor, for example, misdiagnoses your incessant migraines as being due to an abnormal growth in your brain. And so what needs to happen is to remove that portion of your brain causing your migraines. If that's his diagnosis, when what's really going on is that you have a pinched nerve or something in your spine that a few simple visits to a chiropractor could solve, then you would suffer greatly from his misdiagnosis and medical treatment you'd actually suffer more than the presenting problem of the migraines. So it's essential to di rightly diagnose spiritual problems in the same way, or else you'll end up with a worse solution. Turn to Proverbs 28, verse 3. What does Scripture say about this in principle. There's an idea that the oppressed can't be oppressors, that those victimized by racism can't be racists. Those who are marginalized can't exert power over others. Proverbs 28.3 says, A poor man who oppresses the poor is a beating rain that leaves no food. A poor man that oppresses the poor. A poor man can actually oppress others. In other words, being in the same class as some who are oppressed, in this example, the poor, being in a class of potentially oppressed people does not stop those in that class from sinning in the same ways as the people sinning against them. Even oppressed poor people can oppress others. So yes, black people who may experience racism can also play the part of racist. If we rightly define racism the way scripture would and does as partiality based on ethnicity, it's ethnic partiality, 
then obviously blacks can practice partiality even in an ethnic sense by despising others on the basis of ethnicity. That's not difficult. That's clear. That's helpful. Question number two. Do poor people have a right to other people's wealth? This seems to be a dominant assumption. Do poor people have a right to other people's wealth? Tim Keller says, yes, they do. In his book, Generous Justice, he says this, uh, seeking to build a case, using Job and, and other people as examples, he says this, quote, Remarkably, Job is asserting that it would be a sin against God to think of his goods as belonging to himself alone. To not share his bread and his assets with the poor would be unrighteous, a sin against God, and therefore, by definition, a violation of God's justice. Turn to Job chapter 31. He continues to say, as as you turn there, one more quote. Each of the following texts calls those who do justice to share their resources with the needy because God does. He's seeking to build a case based on God's own character to draw a logical deduction for what justice means for us. In principle, not always a bad idea to look at God's character to find out what we should be doing. He goes on to say, though, we do justice when we give all human beings their due as creations of God. Doing justice generosity and social concern, especially toward the poor and vulnerable. This kind of life reflects the character of God. It consists of a broad range of activities from simple, fair, and honest dealings with people in daily life to regular, radically generous giving of your time and resources to activism that seeks to end particular forms of injustice, violence, and oppression. So the way he's defining justice is as giving creations of God their due. And you marry that with the previous statement that Job would have been in sin if he considered his goods as belonging to himself alone. Here's what he's drawing on from Job chapter 31. Look at verse 16. If I have kept the poor from their desire or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the orphan has not shared it. But from my youth he grew up with me as as with a father, and from infancy I girded her, the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or that the needy had no covering, if his loins have not thanked me, And if he has not been warmed with the fleece of my sheep, if I have lifted up my hand against the orphan, because I saw I had support in the gate, let my shoulder fall from the socket and my arm be broken off at the elbow. For calamity from God is a terror to me, and because of his majesty, I can do nothing. He goes on and lists more sinful practices, and then in verse 28 says, That too would have been an iniquity calling for judgment, for I would have denied God above. So you can see how Job, in defense of his own righteousness, lists things that he has done for the poor. He's cared for orphans, helped the poor clothe the naked, aided widows, Tim Keller says that this is Job asserting that his possessions didn't belong to him alone. Here's the error in this kind of thinking. What he's doing here is equivocating the term belonging to himself alone. That's one error. 
Did Job's property and wealth belong to him, or did it belong to Job and the poor? Well, they belong to Job, which is why he had the right to give them away generously. He had the right to act charitably with what God had given to him, what he owned. If they didn't belong to Job, but to the poor as well as Job, then they could have just taken what Job owned and it would not have been stealing. I don't think Tim Keller would like it if poor people moved into his house and kicked him out. If they took his wallet, he would call it theft. The sharing, quote-unquote, of one's belongings is an act of giving it away freely so that the other person who is needy comes to possess it instead of the one giving it. In other words, when biblical sharing takes place, those two people do not have a right to to ownership, an equal claim of ownership over what's being shared at the same time. The practice of sharing is taking what belongs to you and essentially transferring property rights to the other person, saying this is yours. Go to Ephesians 4. Paul even lays this principle out when he talks about how the church ought to think about theft and sharing. Ephesians 4, verse 28 says, He who steals, I hear pages, oh wait. Speaking to the church, he who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to do something else with, to share with one who has need. The person who is a thief and takes what does not rightly belong to him, that implies that those who don't have, don't have a claim to other people's possessions, otherwise it wouldn't be theft. But instead of taking what doesn't belong to you, Paul says, Here's what you ought to do. Labor with your own hands, not laboring through others, but with your own hands, perform what is good so that you will have something. You need to work so that you actually possess things, wealth, property, food, clothing, possessions, work so that they will belong to you, and then you can do what God requires of people who repent of being thieves, being dishonest, being lazy and not working. What do godly people who are not those things practice? They share with those who are needy. That is, that is far different than the, the general category of poor people having a right to everybody else's stuff. The other problem with, with the way that Tim Keller defines justice in this book, Generous Justice, is he broadens the definition to a general give people their due. And then by, by just a, a little sleight of hand and using a word like, you know, what, what, they're, um, what they're owed as creations of God, then you can then build this superstructure on the doctrine of the Imago Dei. People are made in the image of God, and now they deserve all kinds of stuff. They deserve health care. They deserve, you name it, whatever the... You know, it's in the eye of the beholder. 
whatever I feel like image bearers of God need, that's what you owe them. That's, that's a, a subtle and terrible way of arguing for biblical justice. So no, the, the poor do not have an equal claim on other people's wealth. They do have a right to work. They do have a right to work. You'll notice even in what we discussed about the Old Testament laws when God, where God provided for the disenfranchised, if you will, orphans, needy, widows, poor. What was provided was a means of acquiring what they needed. Ruth and, and Naomi are great examples of this in the book of Ruth. They go back and don't ask for a handout. Boaz actually notices Ruth because of her hard work. She gets back into Israel, back for the first time. She, a Moabite, moves into Israel and takes full advantage of the charity that God mandated from his people. So she worked hard, and she was working hard even to provide for her her widowed mother-in-law. That was a wonderful demonstration of godliness and submission to the God of Israel in being to work hard with her own hands, to care for a widow, and to make use of the generosity and impartiality that was established under Mosaic law. And then he did the wise thing and he married that hardworking woman. Number three, question number three, is statistical data a means of upholding white supremacy? Is statistical data a means of upholding white supremacy? In the absence of evidence supporting racial discrimination, for example, unarmed whites are killed more often by police than unarmed blacks, blacks that's, that's true. Statistically, it's true. In the absence of evidence supporting racial discrimination like that fact, proponents of woke thinking will claim that, well, the numbers don't tell the whole story, or the racist institutions don't report the real numbers, or you can't trust police departments to report the real number of blacks being killed because they're run by white supremacists. So appeals to data to real hard data, they get dismissed when it's convenient because the data is apparently skewed by racist institutions in favor of white culture. But then the question is, if there is no data then showing that there's an injustice being committed, how can you be so certain that there's racial injustice present? How do you know the average person who has the same access to the same statistics that are available to everybody else trying to figure out what justice is, how came you to have such insight into data that's not available? And then appeals to, well, my experience, I've seen it with my own two eyes, or I've been the victim of of an injustice. They're not dead if they're making that argument, so they have an experience being killed you know, unarmed. Again, Scripture gives us helpful commentary on on this issue, this principle, because biblical justice requires that guilt be established based on evidence and credible witnesses. Evidence or credible witnesses is how God intends men and women, even children, to be condemned or rewarded, you need facts. Deuteronomy 22, uh, you needed evidence of a woman's unchastity. Matthew 18, church discipline. Jesus made use of the same principle from Deuteronomy. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact must be confirmed. Facts had to be utilized to establish good judgment. Even in John 7:51, Nicodemus, 
you know, being a, a closet disciple of Jesus, one of his shining moments in the Gospels, he actually says in Jesus' defense, our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? And then they just mocked him. That happens today. Don't you actually have to know what happened before you say whether it was just or not? And prominent evangelical leaders have said, no, we don't need to wait for all the facts. This keeps happening. Blacks continue being killed while they're unarmed by white police officers. But how do you know that that one wasn't justified? Because it keeps happening. And, and why do you need evidence then? Just skip the court case and get to condemning the perpetrator. That is not God's justice. And for the sake of having these conversations, what we can actually do to serve people in these conversations is to call them to forsake whatever standards they're using for justice, to repent of trusting in their own mind, of being wise in their own eyes, as Proverbs 3, 5, and 7 term it, and to actually embrace God's better, more wise, more just standard of justice. Whoa, 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 God actually has a standard of justice for the world? What you're articulating? What's that based on? I've asked that question. Okay, you're saying this is just. Says who? What makes you think that that's just? Help me understand. And inevitably, it's, it comes down to this is my own authority, right? My experience, what I deem wise. Okay, well, I can see that your authority is not God's word. Here's what God says about justice. Psalm 19, Proverbs 2 that we've talked about. You can actually know what's really just by submitting to God's wisdom. Can I open the scriptures with you and help you see why that's not just, that's not a good standard? You need to actually repent. If that was, whoever embraces something other than God's standard must repent of that thinking and submit their thinking then to God's opinion in the scriptures. Question number four. Do racial disparities prove racial discrimination? Do racial disparities prove racial discrimination? In other words, if racism wasn't present in the world, then would drastic differences between ethnic groups disappear? Would there be an even distribution of wealth, educational attainments, incarceration rates, etc., between various people groups if there were no racial oppression present in the world. That seems to be the assumption, is that that would be the case. But no, <laughs> that's not a good assumption. Ibram Kendi, in his book Stamped from the Beginning, argues for this view of understanding disparities, differences between ethnic groups. He says this, or he's quoted, summarized by Robin D'Angelo favorably in White Fragility. She says this about Kendi's own views. Kendi goes on to argue that if we truly believe that all humans are equal, then disparity in condition can only be the result of systemic discrimination. If we believe that people are truly equal, then disparity in condition, he says, can only be the result of systemic discrimination. Many people assume that real disparities between blacks and whites, because there are real disparities between blacks and whites, that these must be due primarily to racial prejudice. This is an unjust assumption about why they're happens to be disproportionate representation between racial groups. Take some biblical examples of 
ethnic or group disparities. And this is when you hear statistics, oftentimes people appeal to the data that seems to be in their favor on these issues. And what they're doing is displaying data that shows there are drastic differences. Differences between the incarceration rates of whites and blacks. Differences between uh, educational attainments, wealth obtained, and so forth. And those are real differences. If you took all whites and all blacks, you would get in those categories disparities where whites make more money on average, uh, live in neighborhoods where there's less crime, have greater educational attainments and so forth. That's, that's generally true. We'll get to examining, examining that data in a second. But our disparities, let's just answer the question biblically, our disparities an indication of injustice, where there are drastic group differences does that prove injustice? You, you, you could probably think of a dozen biblical examples of disparities if you had to and write them down right now. Here's some examples. 100%, 100% of Israel's kings, when the nation was united and divided, were Jewish. Was this unjust? Did this prove that there was discrimination, injustice toward non-Jews that they never attained to ruling the kingdom of Israel? No. Because God was the one who required that no non-Jew be a king in Deuteronomy 17, 15. This is, this is when Moses led the nation before there was even a thought of a king Moses said, hey, when you get into the land and you decide you want to be like the other nations and you want a king like the rest of the nations, he can't be non-Jewish. And that's what happened, 100% to 0% of every other ethnicity. That was God's justice that actually created the disparity. Perfect justice created that astounding disparity. 100% of the biblical writers were also Jewish. Uh, some think Luke might be the exception, maybe, but that's still a huge disparity. 100% of the priests, if you, if you, even within the nation of Israel, 100% of the priests had to be descendants of Aaron's family line, according to God's instruction in Numbers 16, verses 39 and 40. Was that discrimination unjust? prejudice against those not of Aaron's lineage? It couldn't have been. God gave the, the law. And he punished those who tried to do something other than that. Korah and others. 100% of Jesus' apostles were Jews as well. All 12 of them. Jesus didn't seem interested in diversifying the 12 from such differences, such disparities. By the way, this gets broken down not only on the basis of ethnicity, but uh, gender and sexual identity and religious preferences. Think of the, all the disparities present just in the 12 men handpicked by the Lord himself, the judge of all the earth. All 12 13 if you include Matthias, 14 if you include Paul, were all Jewish, heterosexual, Christian men. Jesus didn't seem concerned about diversity or that somehow their cultural, that those things were a hindrance to right doctrine. That's important. Being heterosexual Christian Jewish men did not prevent them from getting everything right that they wrote in the scriptures. And this works the other way. God has actually hardened the Jews for a season to where 
the majority, the vast majority for the past 2,000 years of the church has been mostly Gentile. Is God prejudiced against Jews? Of course not. So these are all examples of some disparities in Scripture. Uh, In our own church, there are some disparities. Not the ones that would uh, help anyone trying to say that white supremacists exist here. Just consider, for, for one example, the disparity in church discipline cases that we've had in the past, or the life of the church, really. There's been six that have resulted in excommunication. Church discipline is happening all the time. Step one, people are going to each other, confronting one another about sin, counseling one another on sin. That, that's a part of church discipline. But these have resulted in excommunication six times in the life of our church. 66% of them, of the people excommunicated from this church, have actually been white. None of the, the six people were excommunicated were black. Is that unjust? That there hasn't been an even distribution of people excommunicated? <laughs> of course not. So you understand the point. Various disparities exist sometimes due to obedience to God, not injustice, not a practice of partiality. So if that's the case, if disparities exist by obedience to God at times, then why would we assume that they shouldn't exist in other areas of life? Thomas Sowell, an uh, economist, says this, neither logic nor empirical evidence provides a compelling reason for expecting either equal or random outcomes among individuals, groups, institutions, or nations even. Not logic or empirical evidence. Expecting equal outcomes, even numerical distribution among ethnic lines, wherever injustice and oppression is not a factor, wherever these things are not a factor, is a crucial tenet of what's called disparate theory, or disparate impact, maybe that's a a term you're not familiar with, but disparate theory, disparate impact, sees vast differences between groups as a problem to be solved, as something unjustified and unnatural. One website that reports on police violence, policeviolencereport.org, cites that although blacks make up only 13% of the population, 27% of people killed by police in 2020 were black. So 13% of the population resulted in, or made up, 27% of people killed by police in 2020. By comparison, whites make up 63% of the U.S. population and only 48% of those killed by police in 2020 by the way this website is counting it. Now, there are, there are some issues with the way they even count and derive at these numbers, but let's just assume for a second that they were flawless statistics, perfect reporting. Should the number of blacks and other ethnicities killed by police be similar or close to the percentage that they make up in the population? Because that's the argument. Would justice naturally result in in about 13% of blacks being killed and 63% of whites being killed by police because that is their portion, the portion of the U.S. population that they make up. Now, just ask yourself, who says that in a just nation, people are killed at a rate equal to that nation's ethnic makeup? Who says? Who says that that must be the case? Is there something biblical about that assertion? When you look biblically at justice, is there any principle derived from God's wisdom that says that is the natural outcome of justice? No. No. So if someone's making the assertion, then you can fairly ask, says who? Says who? who? Who says that that 
is the right result of justice. Help me understand where you're getting that. And let them tell you what their source of authority is. And then call them to adopt God. This principle of claim justice demands in this regard that law enforcement kills only, or excuse me, the, the, the true principle of justice. If we're talking about biblical justice, biblical justice demands that law enforcement kills only those who ought to be killed regardless of their ethnicity. No one asks the question on this particular website and in similar conversations that I've had at least, did those people deserve to be killed? What, what percentage of the 27% of black people and the 63% of white people should have been put down by law enforcement because they were a threat to the officers or other people's safety or resisting arrest or non-compliant, whatever. That question rarely comes up, but that's the question that justice is primarily concerned with because it's granting or withholding, rewarding or punishing in keeping with God's law. That's justice. Also, interesting to note about this idea regarding disparities is that there are two, there are two other uh, issues with this. It doesn't take into account those disparities that exist between whites and blacks in which blacks actually exceed their counterparts. It doesn't take into account the disparities that really exist between whites and blacks, but blacks come out on top because those, those exist as well. For example, the last time that a non-black Olympian won the 100-meter dash in the Olympics was Alan Wells in 1980. Over 40 years ago is the last time a white person won the gold medal in the 100-meter dash. Is this a sign of injustice or that athletic speed is found most often in men of West African descent? Nobody's saying... There's an injustice against white men who run the 100-meter dash because they can never win, <laughs> or rarely. <laughs> I didn't make up the numbers. <laughs> they are what they are. <laughs> but the people who most often win have some heritage, are, are descendants of West Africa in most cases. People from there are fast. They got fast genes. Another example, Thomas Sowell cites, anyone who has watched football over the years has probably seen at least 100 black players score touchdowns and not one black player kick the extra point. It's true. Is this because of some twisted racist who doesn't mind black players scoring touchdown but hates to see them kicking the extra points? <laughs> one other example he cites, he says, no one says it is racism that explains why blacks are overrepresented and whites underrepresented in basketball. Why isn't that racism? Why, why isn't the disparate theory applied equally then? That is an unequal measure is what scripture would call that, an unequal application of justice. It's not impartial. Another significant flaw, to, the final thing about, about this idea dealing with disparities is that you'll rarely hear, if ever, about the disparities that exist between whites and other ethnic groups, where other ethnic groups exceed, exceed whites because then that doesn't prove the point. That doesn't prove discrimination. It actually proves the opposite, that the, the, the society isn't controlled by white supremacists. 
to quote Thomas Sowell again, at our leading engineering schools, MIT, Caltech, etc., whites are underrepresented and Asians overrepresented. Is this anti-white racism or pro-Asian racism? Or are different groups just different? Yeah. These, uh, these bad assumptions about disparities between groups have inevitably led to bad solutions, right? We, we said that misdiagnosing the problem will result in a worse solution, and this is exactly what has happened in our society. So that's why you get things like affirmative action that seeks to ensure variety in the workplace, educational institutions, etc. And what you actually have to employ in those instances to make sure that you meet the government's requirement of contrived equality is you actually have to practice partiality. And where people who don't meet the criteria for the diversity you must have represented, you actually have to let them in by sacrificing standards. Uh, certain economists have pointed out that this is actually unhelpful to minorities to let them into institutions in which they don't belong because they don't meet the criteria. You have students who go to prestigious Ivy League institutions because they're let in even though they don't rank in the same category as those who justly get into those institutions, and then they end up doing poorly when they're there, whereas they could go to other institutions and actually excel. So minorities even are hurt by that kind of equality. There's a, an interesting example of, of this. If, if, if equality and justice can be seen just in the disparities, then you actually don't need any example of real injustice. You just have to look at the numbers. And wherever there's a disparity that really is in, in the eye of the beholder, unjust, then they can leverage, you can be guilty of injustice. This happened with Sears a number of years ago. The EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, charged them, found them guilty of discriminatory hiring practices uh, against women, even though there was not a single woman who claimed that the, pra the hiring practices were discriminatory. No woman. And this cost Sears $20 million in legal fees over 15 years simply because when the government looked at their numbers, their hiring numbers, there weren't enough women. And you compare that with biblical justice that actually requires witnesses and evidence to be furnished before condemning anyone. Biblical justice looks really appealing at that point if you don't have an agenda. If your agenda is God's agenda to have true justice. Last question we'll answer. Is preaching spiritual salvation without social liberation a truncated gospel? Is preaching spiritual salvation without social liberation as well preaching a truncated gospel? In 2000, excuse me, in 2018, Paul Tripp wrote an article titled, My Confession, Toward a More Balanced Gospel. In it, he says, By God's grace, I have become deeply persuaded that we cannot celebrate the gospel of God's grace without being commit, committed ambassadors of the gospel of his justice as well. By God's patient grace, I am now convinced that I cannot be a voice for the one, the gospel of grace, 
without being a voice for the other, the gospel of justice. Sadly, I have preached grace and been silent in the face of injustice. The cross forbids me to close my eyes to any form of injustice, whether personal, corporate, governmental, ecclesiastical, or systemic. He's apologizing, confessing in this article that all his years he has been preaching a truncated gospel. You probably didn't know that when you were reading his books. That's what he thinks. His pastor, Eric Mason, author of Woke Church, puts forth the same idea. He says in Woke Church, justification is a huge greenhouse of truth that extends beyond being declared righteous. Justified isn't merely a position, but a practice. That is dangerously close to changing the gospel. He says, Christ's righteousness being imputed to us by faith leads to our being made right with God as well as our making things right on earth. He's not only misdefining justification, being made right with God, that is glorification, the practical making, being made righteous. We are declared righteous. It's a judicial decision by God to declare the person who's not yet made righteous in standing righteous before the judge. Nevertheless, he calls it a position and a practice. And then he goes on to say on page 132 of Woke Church, believers have to be energized by the fact that justice is an active part of the gospel. It is not the gospel, but it is an outward, excuse me, it is not the gospel, but it is an outworking of the gospel. And so he's even confusing at points in his book. But this idea has gained so much traction, especially among those with, uh, who share what we believe about salvation, reformed soteriology, God's sovereignty over salvation. But no, preaching social liberation is not part, it is no part of preaching the gospel. Two examples that make this point. First off, Jesus himself did not decry or attempt to overturn every injustice brought to his attention. Turn to Luke chapter 12. It's popular to cite instances such as Luke 4, when Jesus said, quoting Isaiah, he came to proclaim liberty to the captives, etc., to point to his feeding of the 5,000, to point to his healing of the sick, raising of the dead, practical ways that Jesus did benefit society as evidence that Jesus was about social justice. You'll never hear somebody look at instances like what we see in Luke 12, verse 13 and 14. Jesus is teaching, and someone in the crowd says to him, Teacher, tell my brother to, div to divide the family inheritance with me. He shouldn't be taking it all. I'm being done wrong. This is an injustice. Here you are, judge of all the earth, son of man, son of God. Fix this injustice for me. And Jesus doesn't. Verse 14, but he said to him, man... Who appointed me a judge or an arbiter over you? Jesus, then, then he goes on to teach about human greed. Not only is he not going to solve your injustice, he's pointing out the sin in your heart in this moment. You're greedy. There's another example if you just turn the page, chapter 13, first five verses. Now, on the same occasion, there were some present who reported to him an injustice about the Galileans who were, whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. What are you going to do about that, Jesus? Didn't you, you heard about what happened, right? What Pilate did? Aren't you going to go to that ruler, dethrone him for being unjust, protest? 
something? And Jesus said, verse 2, Do you suppose that these Galileans were greater sinners than all other Galileans because they suffered this fate? I tell you, but unless you repent, you will also likewise, or you will all likewise perish. Jesus takes the opportunity from these people's fixation on somebody else's sin, and instead of addressing the grievance, he almost acknowledges in his statement they suffered this fate, that it wasn't a legitimate injustice. But he doesn't sacrifice or substitute preaching repentance for solving this social ill, this social injustice. If the gospel required that we did both, wherever that was present, then Jesus would have done both. You have to make a decision on, on this passage. Was Jesus wrong for not addressing the injustice? Apparently, Paul Tripp has a better idea of what he should be doing than what Jesus himself did. Jesus was not consumed with addressing every injustice. Sometimes, biblical faithful preaching required addressing those injustices. Other times, preaching the gospel did not, and it would have been a distraction from the gospel to do so. The other example of this that's so glaringly clear is that the apostles didn't preach social liberation. Uh, you can write down 1 Corinthians 7, verses 17 through 24, where Paul actually says to slaves in Corinth and everybody else, single, married, whatever position you find yourself in when you come into the gospel at conversion, be content to stay in that position. And don't be discontent with God not changing that. He does tell slaves, if you have an opportunity to gain your freedom, sure, do that. That's better. But if you don't, don't worry about it. It's okay. He didn't tell them to liberate themselves. He didn't address the masters in Ephesus, Colossae, or on the island of Crete in Ephesians 6, Colossians 3, 1 Timothy 6, Titus 2, to release their slaves, nor is that the purpose of his letter to Philemon. The apostles didn't preach social liberation. You don't have a single instance of them fighting for social liberation in their day. And that is good evidence why that is no part of the mission of the church. All the people that Paul commended in his letters by name, which we're coming up to in, in Romans 16, None of them in all the New Testament was commended for their work of social justice, social liberation, overturning systemic ills of their day. Not one person is commended for their work in that, and plenty of people are commended for their labors in ministry, gospel proclamation, furthering the work of the gospel. The gospel is about Christ and him crucified, and if we adopted, if we added anything else to that, it would ruin the message that we have. We have that as a uniquely, among everybody else who exists, we have that uniquely to offer to the world. We should not sacrifice that for some other agenda. Even adding to it would ruin what we have. But because that is what we have, and because we believe in this church, that we shouldn't be adding anything to it, then we should, <clears throat> we should be the most ardent gospel pro proclaimers. That's all we have to do. So we have undivided attention and energy to go after gospel proclamation. Grace Bible Church, you should be preaching the gospel to your neighbors, to your coworkers, to other students in the classroom. This is what we must be about. Let people who want to mix and divide their attention with other stuff, let them be distracted. We have to get after preaching the gospel, Christ and him crucified. God, thank you for your word. You bring such clarity and conviction where we need it, and you're so crystal clear. Thank you for these things. I pray you would 
make us more zealous to plead with people to repent and be reconciled to God, and that that message, the way we proclaim that and love one another, would prove to the world beyond a shadow of a doubt that Grace Bible Church members belong to you. We are indeed your disciples. We pray in Christ's name, amen. I'll see you in main service.